And we're back. He's the co-founder of NPR's Planet Money, and he's written about Trump's finances for The Times and The New Yorker. He's the author of the book, The Passion Economy. Please welcome Adam Davidson. Adam, thanks for being here. Thrilled to be here, John. I'm really glad to have the chance to talk to you because I've appreciated how you've been looking at Trump's finances over the past few years. We just had this big tax story. What was the biggest surprise? What did you find most remarkable uh, in uh, what The Times uh, published earlier this week? I'd say for the kind of Trump obsessive finance reporters. I wouldn't say it was fundamentally different from what we expected, but the level of detail and the confirmation was just stunning. I mean, this is obviously virtuosic reporting, but there's a very crystal clear story about this guy. He was born to such lucky circumstances. He received a level of wealth that is really astounding, hundreds of millions of dollars from his father. There's a few business deals over the years really very few, maybe Trump Tower, maybe one or two others that he actually, it seemed to be his idea that have been profitable. But for the most part, this is a guy who got incredible wealth from his father, made a series of colossally terrible business decisions, and really lucked into, as Patrick Keefe at The New Yorker so beautifully described, lucked into this apprentice deal that brought in hundreds of millions more. And it it, it really teaches us how awesome it is to be an incompetent, rich white guy in America. Like it's really, really, really good because our tax system is set up to benefit (laughs) you. Our bankruptcy courts are set up to benefit you. Our banking system is set up to benefit you. It is so stunning. Like if he had just taken the money from his dad, taken the money that he got on The Apprentice, put it in any stock fund, even put it in a low interest bearing account, he would be much richer than he is right now. But um, he's had this just flood of support that has uh, made his life far better than I think his merit deserves. The big thing is the questions this raises, the questions it doesn't answer, and in my mind really points to. The Fred Trump money is really, you know, 1973 to 2001, three, four, something like that. It's pouring in from his dad. Mm -hmm. 2005, he's getting this money from The Apprentice. But his biggest spending starts in 2011. Right. And we basically know nothing about where that money came from and who that money was with. So the Times, and this is my one quibble with their reporting, goes to great lengths to give the most generous possible interpretation. He could have saved his apprentice money. If, if you look at his finances just right, there maybe was enough money for him to do this massive spending. And maybe that's true. It's possible that is true. But it is striking that 2011 is also when he started real business relationships with oligarchs in the former Soviet Union and other parts of the world who were also simultaneously laundering money through golf courses and other things. So to me, at a minimum, we need to understand where this money flowed from. And and I don't know that we need to give the most generous interpretation and then say there's nothing more to look at there. That was sort of my experience in reading it too, which is that there's no way to make sense of what we're looking at without assuming there's something very big happening just out of frame, that there's some other information. So to catch us up previously on Trump's finances. So he has this money from his father. He makes a series of very risky and bad decisions. Then at his lowest moment, he's basically rescued by creditors because he owes so much money to so many people. You know, the old adage, if uh, you owe the bank $100, you have a problem. If you owe $100 million, the bank has a problem. So he escapes because basically he is uh, given generous terms because they want to get some kind of recompense for the amount of money he's borrowed. Then years later, The Apprentice saves him. All of a sudden, in the years before he runs for president, he's borrowing obscene amounts of money uh, while registering huge losses. Do you have any idea where that money is going? Like, where is the money going? Huge amounts are coming in. He's registering huge losses. Is there any explanation other than some kind of fraud or some kind of money laundering to explain why all of a sudden, beyond 2010, right, he takes this massive $70 million deduction, uh, writing off a bunch of old losses, and he starts borrowing money at an incredible clip, just taking on huge, huge amounts of debt. Where did that money go? Where has it gone? And there's two questions. Where did it come from and where did it go? Where did it go? And, right. Yes, you, you've asked yeah. the question, where did it come from? You have questions about foreign inf- interests, oligarchs, what have you. Where did it go? Where's right. this money? <laughs> so a lot of it went into golf courses. I mean, the Trump Organization is essentially a Scottish golf development company. That is what it is now. And sure. 
that makes zero sense. I went to Scotland. I went to the courses. I talked to so many Scottish experts. Golf happens to be growing like crazy in Asia, even in Africa, Latin America. You can imagine newly middle class, newly rich. They're like, what do you do if you're rich? Oh, I guess you play golf. So you can imagine there's golf courses, Russia, former Soviet Union. There's places in the world where golf is really growing. Scotland happens to be the one place on earth that is the most oversaturated with golf courses. It's increasingly an older person's game. Right when uh, I saw there, there's an annual, the death of the golf industry conference in Scotland. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> so he's pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into golf Two courses in Scotland, a course in Ireland, the Doral, all of which are losing millions of dollars a year. Now, there is one reading, which is the Times doesn't say it's for sure, but they say it could be. This is all his money, and he just loves golf. He's just crazy. He loves golf. And yes, these make no money, but he doesn't care. He's going to invest in these golf courses. And that may be true. It is possible that that is true. It is noteworthy in my mind that golf is known to be a major tool of not just in general money laundering, but precisely the people he is partnering with, the Aguilarovs, the Mamadovs, Harry Tenasebjo in Indonesia. And if you want, we can get into why golf courses are such a particularly great money laundering tool. You know, I'm a, I'm a business reporter. You don't normally see business people who do hotels and they do residential, then they do casinos and they do airlines, then they do TV right. entertainment, then they do golf. These are <laughs> different industries with different requirements. And he keeps the same basic staff. It's the same team, you know, people like Michael Cohen float in and out, but it's the same basic finance team, legal team throughout. And so I asked the question, what are they good at? Like they're clearly sticking around. They clearly have accumulated knowledge. And what becomes very clear is what they seem to be good at, putting good in quotes, is having an enormous risk tolerance for doing wildly ostentatious things like buying a casino in New Jersey, having the biggest fine ever for failing to have proper anti-money laundering controls, all, all the things we know about his business practices. So the thing we don't know is what's happening from 2011 on, why these projects, etc. To me, the story he tells Maybe it's true. It seems just so unlikely, given the evidence we have. I, to be honest, like I don't know what value this has in the election at this point, but there is something I think ultimately important about really unpacking the fact that the current president of the United States has a massive international business that may exist simply for the purposes of laundering money and defrauding investors and taxpayers around the world, basically. Uh, and we don't know. We have no, we don't know enough about it. So he's laundering money through these businesses, let's say, potentially, which means he's basically saying that these businesses cost obscene amounts of money to run. They're huge losers, money. Oh my God, the, to run this golf course in Scotland, you have no idea my expenses, like the golf balls, the raking the traps. It's, in, it's extraordinary how much money this is taking. That doesn't necessarily explain why all of a sudden he would start taking on huge amounts of debt in the years before he runs for president. Why all of a sudden he's taking out uh, loans against property he's already paid off in full. To your, have you seen anything that helps you understand why all of a sudden in this decade, in the last 10 years, he goes on this borrowing binge uh, and kind of leverages against so much, so much of what he had previously owned outright? So I, I do feel like the journalistic requirement to give like the best case scenario, uh -huh. which to me uh, is not the please. most likely case. But so the sure. best case scenario is <laughs> truly he got obsessed with golf courses. He wanted great golf courses. He loves playing golf. He loves owning golf courses. That is what his people keep saying. That's what he says. And these weren't making money, but he just decided to keep pouring money into them. And that I suppose is possible. <laughs> Again, it is out of keeping with everything he's ever done. You know, it requires a kind of patience for the math to work. He'd have had to have saved a lot of the money in 2004, five and six from the apprentice, held on to it, then spent it, then borrowed more. He'd have had to have made investment decisions in 2005 that would only really pay off in 2020. It, to me, it just doesn't feel like the guy we're getting. Yeah, it doesn't you know, sound like Donald Trump I know. It doesn't sound like the Donald Trump I know. There is another explanation, which is these are generating revenue, but they're just generating a different kind of revenue, that they are platforms for handling payments for other people. And he doesn't really own them. The debt and the income or the losses are fictions on, on, on a spreadsheet. 
to mask the real business that is going on. Some things that are really worth mentioning. We know for a fact, because the Trump organization has admitted it, that they were part of money laundering operations. Now, their claim is they had no idea, even though these had hallmark you know, so the Azerbaijan, the term Tower Baku is the one I know the best because I reported it, but it was essentially as clear a money laundering. It, it was the Mamada family, or I'm guessing you might not know everything about the Azerbaijani oligarch class, but they are no, the yeah, most not, corrupt. Not as much as I should. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> they are the most corrupt. I mean, there, there's some great in the Wiki cables, the WikiLeaks cable gate. Um, we read American officials, you know, thinking it's secret, talking about them. And they say they are wildly corrupt for Azerbaijan, which is saying a lot because Azerbaijan is one, one of the most wildly corrupt countries in the world. And they are partners with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard at the same time <laughs> that they're doing business with Trump. And it seems very likely that they're laundering money for the Islamic Revolutionary Guard of Iran. So that is one deal. The Georgia deal with um, looking up the Toronto deal, the Vancouver deal, the Baja deal, the Panama deal, the Dominican Republic deal, the Uruguay deal, <laughs> Indonesia deal, Filipina deals. These all have wild hallmarks of money laundering with people who are known to be laundering money at the same time with the same kind of business practices. They haven't been proven because we allow white collar crime to go on um, uninvestigated for the most part in this country and around the world. So we know he's making money from money laundering. The question is, is he also saying, Yes, okay, but I don't want that to touch my golf business because I just love golf so much. I don't want that to have anything to do with the biggest business I'm doing where I need the most ready cash as quickly as possible because I just have this internal desperation for golf. So to me, the overall story, just it's hard to add up as, as a legitimate story. I want to get to the implications which you just raised about right collar crime, about his presidency. Uh, but I want to ask one more question about this because this is another another area I think you've you've touched on a fair amount, which is all right. So we have the running concerns, the going concerns that may be tools for moving money and other forms of fraud. There are also all of these sort of kind of slapdash <laughs> failed projects. Do you think some of the failed American projects, where they kind of you know put their names on a building, tell investors, hey, uh, this place is almost sold out, get a bunch of money in, and then basically walk away from the project? There's tax fraud, which we've talked about. It's very clear to me that Ivanka and the family should have been prosecuted for in New York, which is defrauding investors. Do you think some of these failed projects in the U.S. have also been money laundering machines? What do you think? It's not that I think so. I know so. I mean, it's no. Okay. The Trump Tower Soho, I've talked to people who worked on the project. It was set up in such a way as to foster money laundering. Almost every luxury project in Manhattan, Miami, L.A., London, is built in some part on money laundering. So that, that, and the Times did some great reporting on this a while ago. And just so people understand what that means, right? Like it basically, you buy a piece of property in the name of a fake corporation, uh, which is using illicit money. Then when they sell the property, it's listed as a real estate profit. And all of a sudden the money is now suddenly above board. Is that some, some that's a simplified yeah. version, but that's basically the gist. That's a how simplified version. You are a corrupt businessman in Moscow or Azerbaijan or wherever you have millions and millions of dollars. You're worried that one day Putin or whoever is going to take all your money away. So you want to have money in America, but you can't just transfer it to like a Citibank account because post 9-11, et cetera, it will be flagged. Like, oh, you're clearly a corrupt guy. We can't just open a bank account with $10 million because we don't know where that came from. Right. But you can very easily create a shell corporation, buy some luxury properties, then eventually sell them and then that money is now clean. It happens all the time. Nobody checked where the money came from when you bought the property. When you sell it and you say, say to the you know, US government, where did this money come from? You say, oh, it came from the sale of this property that it already owned. Exactly. It's a huge problem. It's a huge problem, a known problem. Trump is well, actually a minor player compared to some other players. Right. But all those giant new luxury towers in Manhattan that are mostly open and are owned by oligarchs, it's open, explicit. <laughs> Nobody's wondering yeah. about it. You, everybody knows what's going on. And Trump, no question was part of that. But then you also look at the ownership structure of the whole project. So, you know, Trump Soho, you have this shadowy figure to Fikari from Kazakhstan. You have Felix Sater, who's working on another Kazakh money laundering scheme at the same time. I think legally, it's one thing to just, hey, look, I sell apartments. I don't do all the due diligence to make sure the guy's not corrupt. But it's a whole other thing to set up the system so that That's the it, it can facilitate money laundering. Now, the next step would be, I'm going to set up a whole shell company where I'm going to say I own it. That's an even 
safer thing. If I'm the corrupt oligarch and I open a bunch of KFCs, that happens to be one of the things the Mamata family did. They opened a bunch of KFCs in around London. But I say it's John Lovett's KFCs. As far as the world's concerned, it's yours. But you and I have a secret contract where I'm providing, you know, marketing advice or something for $20 million a year or whatever it is. So we know for sure he's laundering money. We know who he's laundering money with. These are people who have a lot more money to launder than the money they've put through the known Trump avenues. The question is, is it a small side business where he's making a few million a year or is it central to his core business? And the truth is, I do not know nobody outside of, you know, Trump and Alan Weisselberg and we hope maybe, you know, the New York Attorney General or something knows for sure. But you always hear with money laundering, it has all the hallmarks, it raised red flags. And the reason for that is at base, the way money laundering works is there are private transactions that we cannot see unless we have subpoena power. There is no way, unless someone really screws up for a journalist to definitively prove that money went to this person at this time. I would say Trump is the cleanest, easiest to prove of anyone I've ever looked at because he's so sloppy. He's, it's so blatant. The real sophisticated stuff, like Putin's real cronies, they're working with like top banks, top law firms. They're really doing it in the sophisticated way. Trump's working with, you know, as one person said, thick neck guys in cheap Turkish suits. That's his crowd. You know, as Michael Cohen has said, which I, I, I think is true, Trump is in some kind of financial distress in the run up to the presidential election. He runs for president. Uh, largely to create an infomercial. It goes better than expected uh, for him. Uh, He's now president. Uh, It's clear from the Times reporting and other reporting that he has a bunch of debt coming due. He's in the middle of this uh, re-election. Obviously, being re-elected protects him from prosecution, which is clearly on his mind. But it seems to me that becoming president has brought a lot of attention on his unsophisticated money laundering operations. And in the next few years, a tremendous amount of debt is coming due. What is the tension there? What happens with all this debt as it begins coming due in the next year, two years, three years, four years? I mean, this is hundreds of millions of dollars. Some people have said, I think I think you've even estimated that it goes well beyond the you know roughly 500 million that the Times has uncovered, that it may be closer to a billion dollars. Trump, of course, uh, uh, decided to go to Twitter and, and, and say, um, even in the debate, I'm, I'm under leveraged, right? Which I feel like is less for his fans than more for his creditors. Right. Because, you know, the election is one thing, but they're coming for his money. What the fuck happens when you have a president who is suddenly uh, responsible for half a billion dollars in debt and has no capacity to pay it? What happens? And and the big question is, who does he owe it to? Yeah. Who, who, God. yes. I'm worried about two other things even more than that. Because Trump oh, does no. have the capacity to, you know, just walk away. He has, you know, just say, I'm not paying you, screw you. And, you know, the most delightful, ridiculous, you know, ostentatious example of how great it is to be a rich schmuck, like you were saying, it's, it's the bank's problem, is when the bankers, when he was fully bankrupt, not only agreed to restructure his loans, but agreed to an allowance so that he could continue the theater of being a rich person because they saw it in their interest that he continued to live in a fancy houses and fly in a private jet. Because they were on the hook for the brand. Because they were on the hook for the brand. Exactly. They, the brand was how the hotels could make money. Yeah. And if he was living in like a four-story walk-up in Queens and <laughs> couldn't afford hair dye, like, you know, they'd lose more money. It's good to be rich in America. It really is. Or, or to have been rich anyway. Um, mm-hmm. So here's the things I'm concerned about. So international financial fraud requires international police coordination. And I know, I talked to the former head of money laundering investigations in the UK, who's been And there's a bunch of people in Scotland who have, in the government, who have been calling for investigations. And it has been, as I understand it, a decision we're not investigating the sitting U.S. president. Like, what what are we going to get out of that? That's a crazy thing to do. Obviously, we don't expect a lot from Azerbaijani law enforcement, Indonesian law enforcement, Russian law enforcement, etc. But, you know, the way this works is there's corrupt money in one country or illegal money in one country. It flows often through one or two other countries and then ends up in the United States. So you need the partnership of several law enforcements. And this exists. There is an international system set up to manage these relationships. Doesn't work perfectly, but it exists. It has been completely shut off. Obviously, the U.S. is not investigating him in this way. It seems like the New York AG, the Manhattan DA, maybe the New Jersey AG are doing it, but 
they can't force another country to do it or the U.S. government to do it. So I think he's got to be very worried about that. I think Ivanka's got to be done. Junior's got to be. They were the face of this international operation, not just the face. I mean, I think actively involved in these deals. Famously, there's emails from Don Jr. that are like, as long as nobody gets these emails, we're in the clear. Nobody could know how we're lying about the investors. I mean, there's like, exactly. there's a doc, yeah. that's a, there's a incredibly stupid email chain that implicates them, at least in Trump Soho, for example. Exactly. Literally saying... <laughs> As long as people don't know that we're lying consciously, then they can't prove it's a crime. It's, it's a dumb email to write. Don't write that email. So that's one thing. The other thing, though, here's what I'm more worried about than the deaths is what's the story he's telling himself or others are telling him about the future of his life. So we know, the New Yorker did some great reporting on this, that there are operations intelligence operations in Israel, in India, in China, in Saudi Arabia, in the Emirates, and presumably lots of other countries to figure out how to present lucrative business opportunities to people around Trump and presumably Trump himself in exchange for serving the interests of those states. You know, we, we have strong reason to think Jared Kushner was maybe an unwitting, but certainly a recipient of this. Michael Flynn almost certainly was. Um, lots of other Trump cronies, the people who are calling Trump every day and he, who he's talking to and making decisions with are doing it. Now, I think if I were doing that with Trump, I wouldn't be so naked as to say, hey, I'll give you a billion dollars if you do this, but I'd flatter him and I'd tell him, hey, boy, you know, you could really clean up with this business or that business, but we'd really need this to happen. That's the thing I'm actually the most worried about. Like, we know what the downside is, criminal prosecution, bankruptcy. But what's the upside? And what does he think he gets to offer in the next four years that really maybe does make him feel like he's truly a billionaire? Yeah, the opportunity to make money in transactions around the world with special access and terms because you're the president of the United States. I mean, that's extraordinary. You think about Baby Doc in Haiti or Mobutu Sesiseko in Zaire. We worked out these deals. We're like, hey, you get to live in the south of France. We'll give you like a great mansion. You just get to be a rich guy for the rest of your life. You just have to leave your country and not have any power. And there are times where I'm like, can we just do that? Like, just give him. His buddies, the Agalarovs, have this massive luxury golf estate outside of Moscow. Just say, you know what? You get to go there. You can tweet all day long. You know, anytime you want to give a speech, we'll film it. But you just have to like go there. Maybe maybe we use the old U.S. approach to. You know what? No deal. No deal. <laughs> no no deal. fucking deal. Adam, <laughs> thank you so much. I want to ask you one last question because hearing all of this, right? There's just the, the implications for national security are obvious. The implications for having a president with these sort of urgent financial needs is the, the implications are, 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 I think, so terrible. The news is focused on $750. He's paying $750 in taxes because it's easy to understand. It's, it's unfair. It's wrong. It seems to me that what we're watching is what happens when a country doesn't take white collar crime seriously for decades, that all of these people uh, were able to evade accountability to the point where, whether it's Manafort, or Trump, or Michael Cohen, or many of the other collaborators uh, with Trump over the years, that all of these people should have been punished and taken off uh, the field a long time ago, but they haven't. What do you see as the hope for getting white collar crime to be part of the national conversation in a way that gets people to actually understand that, hey, hold on a second, we're auditing poor people in Mississippi for the earned income tax credit, while we're, we are literally having the federal government write Donald Trump a check for $72 million and then, then opening up an investigation into whether or not he earned it. How do we make that understandable to people uh, given the stakes? That to me is both the biggest issue. This is what happens when you have an economic system, a, a legal system, a tax system that rewards congealed wealth, past wealth. What you want in a capitalist country is that you are incentivizing everybody to take forward-looking risks, to come up with ideas, to do business, to take a job that is going to generate more revenue in the future. And one of the ways we used to differentiate the U.S. from developing economies is developing economies, capital stays in the small group of people who already have it. So you have the idiot nephews of Chinese party leaders or Haitian generals or Saddam Hussein's brother-in-law or whatever, getting 
money and smart people not being able to fund their ideas. Big, thoughtful economists, like not just Bernie Sanders, are deeply concerned that in the various laws that started under Jimmy Carter, obviously took off under Reagan, but have continued, have really shifted dramatically the way that wealth is rewarded simply for being wealthy, not for generating new ideas, et cetera. I think this is the issue of our time. I think we have known in theory that this leads to anti-democratic authoritarianism, but we are seeing it with our own eyes as clearly as possible. I think what you just said is so important. Trump is a known symptom of a deep rot in an economic system. It is the economic system, though, that ultimately is to blame. And I see this as the fight of our lifetime. If Trump changes his medication and tomorrow he's like, boy, I really screwed up. I'm dropping out. I'm just going to be a decent citizen for the rest of my life. We still have that problem. There are days when I think maybe the one thing we got from Trump is it's just now open. There's no pretending. Like the Republican Party is in favor of the congealed wealth of white men being maintained and does not really, all its economic theories are just window dressing. It's not true. This is the fight of our lifetime. This is why it's not over in November. It's not over in January. It's not even over in 2024 or 28. When you look throughout history, this is when economies collapse. It's what happened in Rome. It's what happened in Italy, in Venice. Iraq was a functioning country. Haiti was a functioning country. Um, This happens. Countries turn to self-dealing for rich people, powerful people, and then that leads to autocracy. And it's just textbook. I'm still interested. <laughs> From the inside, I feel as though we have a stake in it. So I, no, no, we have a huge stake. No, it's I'm like those kidding. great things when people say, what if America was reported on the way we report on developing countries? Like, if we take away our American exceptionalism for a minute and tell the story of... Haiti from 1957 to 1977, say, or Iraq from 1958 to 1998. This is a thing that happens. They were problematic countries, but they were functioning economies. They were functioning political systems that were hijacked by a small band of interests. I mean, Hitler's the great example that thought they could put forward a thuggish idiot to protect their interests. And that thuggish idiot ended up polluting the very nature and, and punishing both the old wealth, but really punishing the institutions and the democracy. It's a very standard story. And Trump is just a part of it. He's not the end of it. And that's why this election is our last chance to tell a different kind of story. Adam Davidson, thank you so much for your time. So good talking to you. Really appreciate it. This was a joy. Thanks so much. I had a lot of fun. Thank you to Adam Davidson for joining us. When we come back, we'll end on a high note. Don't go anywhere. This is Love It or Leave. 